Well, thank you, everybody, and welcome to the Heritage Foundation. I'm delighted you could join us uh, for this year's Russell Kirk Lecture, which we are very pleased to co-host uh, with our friends at Alliance Defending Freedom. The namesake of this lecture, Russell Kirk, established the philosophical foundations of the modern conservative movement. Kirk's political philosophy, which he summarized in his Six Canons of Conservatism, emphasized tradition and convention, transcendence and piety, political prudence, and ordered liberty. In addition to his landmark books, The Conservative Mind and the Roots of American Order, Kirk was instrumental in the founding of National Review and Modern Age, and was, for many years, a distinguished fellow here at Heritage. We are privileged that Ayan Hirsi Ali has agreed to deliver this year's lecture, which will be on defining civilization down. Following her remarks, she will be joined on stage by my colleague, Kristen Muth, and by Kristen Wagner, the President and General Counsel at Alliance Defending Freedom, for some moderated questions and answers before inviting some questions from the audience, if time permits. Ayan Hirsi Ali was born in Somalia in 1969 and was raised there and in Saudi Arabia and Kenya. In 1992, while en route to an arranged marriage um, to a distant cousin, she escaped to the Netherlands, where she eventually became a leading member of the Dutch parliament. In 2006, she moved to the United States after accepting a fellowship at the American Enterprise Institute, which was headed at the time by Chris Demuth, and she became an American citizen in 2013. In 2007, she founded the AHA Foundation, an organization committed to preserving, protecting, and promoting Western freedoms and ideals. In addition to currently serving as a research fellow at the Hoover Institution, Ms. Hersey Ali is a best-selling author, a prolific essayist, uh, essayist, and has received many awards for her courageous opposition to political Islamism and her vigorous advocacy of the sadly declining Western traditions of freedom of religion, inquiry, and speech. Please join me in welcoming Ayan Hirsi Ali. John, thank you very much for that. Distinguished scholars, friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to be with you today to give the 2024 Russell Kirk Lecture. I'm deeply grateful to the Heritage Foundation and Alliance Defending Liberty for the invitation. Like Edmund Burke in his own age, Mr. Kirk tried to convince his countrymen that there were truths and virtues, ancient truths and trustworthy virtues worth guarding and handing on to our children. In this vein, Mr. Kirk expounded six canons of conservatism, tradition and convention, transcendence and piety, political prudence and ordered liberty. Today, I'll focus on the relation between convention and ordered liberty and the one virtue without which neither are possible, courage. Domestically, both order and liberty are threatened by changing conventions that measure conduct with two sticks, one for the majority and especially the white, middle and working classes and another for minority groups. Abroad, order and liberty are threatened when one standard is expected of the United States and another of other nations or groups. In the Holy Land and Arab world, one standard is applied to a single nation, Israel, which is held to unmeetable standards in its battle with Hamas, Hezbollah, and Iran, while Israel's neighbors are routinely held to much lower standards that regard terrorism and savagery as part of a course or even necessary. The result of this double standard globally is to define civilization down. It creates a moral third world by permitting the worst actors to pass master while excluding the best 
from the, converse, from the conversation. It permits, for instance, a court with judges from my native Somalia and from China to pass judgments on Israel, the Middle East's sole democracy. So what's at stake here? It's not always possible to get a second chance in life. The West failed the first time to protect the Jews of Europe, and the Holocaust was the result. October 7th, in my view, we have a second chance. A new normal is emerging, wherein Israel is seen as the sole aggressor in Jews worldwide as the real problem. We must reply, this is not normal, it's not true, and it won't form any part of our moral conventions and foreign policies. Anti-Semitism is one of the oldest conspiracy theories. We must root it out of our lands and sometimes even out of our own hearts. I'll begin domestically, where I find the source of our current foreign policies weak. Then I'll move to identify three international arenas that there is less scrutiny. And then I'll speak and take the time to talk about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I came to Washington, D.C. in September of 2006 for my own safety. I had left the Netherlands, where I lived since 1992, and served as a member of parliament. Those who threatened me and continue to do so today are a, sub a, a subset of Muslims inspired by a mix of ideology and religion called political Islam or Islamism. I said back then that Muslims in Europe were not held to the same standards to which other Europeans are held. Europeans who had welcomed us by the hundreds of thousands. I explained to Americans that this lowering of standards to appease Arabs and Muslims was racism dressed up as compassion and disdain masquerading as kindness. I thought it was moral confusion and it was dangerous, so we sadly saw. I looked up to America, and particularly to many Americans. I thought that they recognized that Islamism had been fashioned into a modern totalitarian ideology. The devastating attacks of 9-11-2001 had happened only five years earlier. I was told that Americans were still a young, strong, vibrant nation. She had the spirit to fight and vanquish whomever dared attack her. After all, America had led the struggle against national socialism and later communism, the deadliest ideology in the second half of the 20th century. She had won resoundingly, not only in the corridors of power and through diplomacy and market capitalism, but also on the battlefield of ideas. I therefore assumed that America would readily recognize a totalitarian ideology for what it was, even if it shrouded itself in religious garb. Little did I know that the double standards that I had been complaining about in Europe, in fact, originated in America, along with their heated and bitter debates that to this day remain unresolved. It even goes as far back as the 20th century discussions on the attempts at moral equivalence between the Soviet Union and the United States. I borrowed the title of this speech from the late Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who published his classic essay in 1993, Defining Deviancy Down. In that essay, he concluded that the amount of deviant behavior in American society has increased beyond the levels the community can afford to recognize, and that accordingly, we've been redefining deviancy so as to exempt much conduct previously stigmatized, and also quietly raising the normal level in categories where behavior is now abnormal by any earlier standard. The reasons he said were altruistic, opportunistic, and denial, but the result was the same an acceptance of mental pathology, broken families, and crime as a fact of life. In that same summer, Charles Krauthammer responded to Senator Moynihan with a speech at the American Enterprise Institute. He acknowledged Senator Moynihan's point, but said that was only one side of the story. 
Deviancy was defined down for one category of society, the lower classes and the black communities. For the middle classes that are overwhelmingly white and Christian, the opposite was true. Deviancy was in fact defined up, stigmatizing and criminalizing behavior that was previously regarded as normal. In other words, there was a, a double standard at work. Krauthammer reckoned that this double standard makes us feel good. A society must feel that it's policing its norms by combating deviancy. Having given up fighting the real thing, we can't give up the fight. This double standard of defining deviancy up and down maps onto a later trend I saw in public life when I served in the Parliament of the Netherlands, summed up as equality for us, culture for them. If, quote, youths of immigrant families would harass women on the streets, it was part of their culture. When a Dutchman discouraged his daughter from dating such youths, he was termed a racist. Double measuring abroad. America's troubles now contribute to the spread of double measuring abroad, and here are three examples. The eco-warriors, the ones who like to block roads in Britain and vandalize art in our museums and harass our energy workers at sea. But China, which is regularly opening new coal power plants, gets a free pass. There are no such protests against China's energy policy because they would be forcibly suppressed. And none at the West because climate activists want to villainize authorities in their own nations while avoiding offense to the leaders of international socialism. Second example is of course the human rights. When it comes to human rights, every country could do better. But if you follow mainstream news, you might be excused for believing that the greatest human rights abuses occur in the United States rather than say in Iran, where the population is kept in theocratic submission. For us, the bar is now set so high, we can never hope to reach it. For them, it is set so low that they can never fall beneath it. In November 2023, Iran hosted the United Nations Human Rights Council meeting in Geneva. Um, Third example, and closer to the bone, is cultural Marxism. According to the logic of intersectionality, white silence is white violence. But white speech is also a form of violence. For white Americans, both silence and speech are potentially violence. But actual physical violence committed by black Americans or selected minorities is a form of legitimate protest or speech. In reply to the massacre of Israelis on October 7, one Black Lives Matter sympathetic journalist thought, what did you all think decolonization meant? Vibes, papers, essays, losers. I'm going to focus now on the Israel-Palestinian conflict. The application of moral double standards is seen at its most dramatic when it comes to the now of a 70-year-old Arab-Jewish conflict. Consistently defining deviancy up for Jews and Israel and down for Arabs and Muslims is a form of moral confusion that, had led, that has led us to persistent strategic and policy failures. This conflict has become a crucible for at least three false assumptions. The first, we are told that if Israel continues to pursue her mission to destroy Hamas, then Israel will create the next generation of Islamists and terrorists, not just in the Middle East, but across the globe. Therefore, Israel should agree to a ceasefire and hold to it, even if, as would certainly be the case, the other side does not. This assumption is false. The overwhelming evidence of the last 75 years is that Islamist extremism is unaffected by what Israel does or fails to do. The extremists are created in the classrooms, in the sitting rooms in neighborhoods of Muslim and Arab countries, 
in madrasas and in mosques, many of which are half a world away from Israel. Since 9-11, we've also seen these centers of indoctrination sprout up in the foreign funded mosques, madrasas and Islamic centers across Europe and the United States. Another false assumption is that Bibi Netanyahu has done or failed, uh, it is because of what Bibi Netanyahu has done or failed to do that caused Hamas's savage attacks. By casting Netanyahu as the belligerent, uncompromising, democracy undermining monster, we shift attention away from the core issue, which is the belligerent, uncompromising Palestinian intransigence backed by the Islamic Republic of Iran. Since 1947, the Arabs have remained fixed in their determination to eliminate the state of Israel, in part by preventing peace from ever coming about. While the failed peace attempts in 1973, 1993, 1995, 1998, 2000, and 2008 all the fault of Bibi Netanyahu? Was no Arab agency involved? Take the Oslo Accords and their follow on at Camp David in 2000. Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, later assassinated, offered a separate Palestinian entity short of a state. PLO leader Yasser Arafat left the negotiating table. Washington and London are currently pushing a two-state solution in response to the October 7th attacks. If, quote unquote, a solution were implemented, it would continue the pattern of dysfunction and lead to the next eruption of deadly violence. When terrorists get rewarded with a state, terrorism becomes a tool of political persuasion. The same kinds of terrorism will recur, which will invite Israel to retaliate which will result in more demands being met. Third, we are told that the classic human dynamic of war and peace does not apply to this conflict. The standard dynamic is that the winner takes all so that a lasting peace can occur. The logic or that logic has never been applied to the Israel-Palestinian conflict. Up until 1967, the conflict was called the Arab-Israel War. Israel defeated the Arab countries in the Six Day War and again in the Yom Kippur War, six years later. At that point, the name of the war was changed to the Israel-Palestinian conflict and the territories Israel had acquired in defending itself against aggression were declared to be occupied and therefore illegitimate. In war, when there is no winner, no truce holds and peace can never prevail. October 7th, 2023 illustrated the swift descent from civilization into barbarism. The threat always lingers under the surface and in our hearts. But on that day, the heinous acts themselves were manifested in the massacre of innocent, unarmed, and totally unprepared civilians. These were young people at a music festival, many of them peaceniks. Family members were shot, stabbed, and mutilated in front of one another. Babies were shot, beheaded, and burned. Similar things were done to the elderly. Women were raped, reportedly even as corpses. Homes were burned, and the perpetrators reveled in their acts. Their GoPro cameras were set to record. They uploaded the grim footage to various online platforms for they knew large audiences awaited that barbaric footage. One terrorist called his parents to boast about just killing 10 Jews. Mashallah, they said. Celebrations ensued, not only by Palestinians, but also by many Arabs, Muslims, and fellow travelers on Western university campuses. Top university administrators displayed a shocking level of moral confusion in response to these campus, campus events celebrating the horrors of October 7, calling for the elimination of the Jewish state. Who lives between the river and the sea after all? Famously, the three women of the Ivies could not even take the carriage before Congress simply to say, we condemn this. The ensuing 
demonization of Israel for waging what is historically a standard siege and the relentless calls for a ceasefire have followed. These calls have been so effective that now Israel's greatest allies, the United Kingdom and the United States, are twisting Israel's arm to concede. Even without the appeasement of a complete ceasefire, we know full well that it's only a matter of time before Hamas and her helpers reorganize and repeat the atrocities of October 7. We know it because this has been Hamas's pattern. Attack, provoke a retaliation, complain of disproportionality, then acquire the world's sympathy, a negotiated ceasefire, aid, and the time to plan the next attack. The pattern of Palestinian misconduct that we've allowed ourselves to get accustomed to and even become desensitized to can be seen in the series of events beginning in 1947, when the Palestinians sabotaged the United Nations partition plan. With the help and incitement of the major Arab powers of the day, they went to war in 1948. They lost that war, a loss that was never fully accepted by the Arab world. On September 6, 1970, the proxies hijacked international commercial flights. Later that month, the Black September group attempted to overthrow the Jordanian government. Then in 1972, the same group carried out the Munich Olympics massacre. In 1994, Hamas killed around 55 Israelis and injured over 150 in an effort to derail the peace process. They stated that these attacks were a part of jihad against Israel's occupation. Hamas eventually became the voice of the hardliners and finally of many mainstream Palestinians and Arabs. In 2000, they rejected the, they rejected the Camp David Accords and they started an intifada. The international community has been treated to the routine reneging on or sabotaging of peace deals that are near completion. The well-known misuse of funds from those organizations, whether UNRWA or UNFIL or another useful international laundering acronym, this money is used in the development of tunnels, suicide terror attacks, which often involves the training and use of children. Civilians are used as human shields and tools of the propaganda war. At school, the children are taught to kill and die. Palestinian leaders raise money from pariah states. They acquire weapons and stratagems and expertise to continue waging war, even as these leaders are at the table pretending to be engaging in peace talks. Overall, they engage systematically in deception, doublespeak, and duplicity. Decades of deviant behavior have been normalized by making it all seem necessary. Endless excuses are made on behalf of the Palestinians. We are told the occupation is unbearable or to legitimize their excuses for norm violations. Throughout this conflict, Palestinians and their backers have been denied agency. Yet somehow, they're still seen as active freedom fighters. The story suggests that if only Israel would grant every Palestinian concession, then the entire Arab world would become democracy-loving, rainbow flag-waving, Jew-hugging Swedes. <laughs> Nevertheless, there are rays of hope. Within a few hours of the October 7th massacre, the Moroccan regime condemned the violence against civilians. The UAE called the event barbaric and heinous and demanded that Hamas immediately release the hostages. This is not nothing, and it shows that one source of the rot, Gulf funds for, indoct for the indoctrination of Palestinian children may one day dry up. The United States should help this along by applying the same standards of conduct to Muslims and Jews, the same standards of statecraft to Arab nations, Iran and Israel. Regimes like the UAEs need to be helped and rewarded. Arabs have agency. When they, exercise, when they exercise it well, they deserve our gratitude, our respect, and possibly our trade deals. Conversely, when they use that agency to promote the death cult of political Islam, they must be condemned and shunned. Arabs and Persians must be treated as adults who can make rational choices, not as moral primitives or squabbling children who just need a little longer in time out. 
and a bit of creative appeasement to make them behave responsibly. It won't happen. Let me summarize what has been said above before I conclude. Defining deviancy up for Israel and down for her enemies has brought us into the moral confusion and almighty mess that is unfolding today in the Middle East. What we must immediately do is to support Israel's righteous mission to defend her security. We must defend her from the information warfare and hostile propaganda that she is subjected to. We must seek to sustain a majority that understands that Israel is on the threshold of being destroyed by her implacable enemies. We must seek to persuade young Americans of these things. We must not frustrate or sabotage Israel's efforts to achieve the full destruction of Hamas and to embark on the long and hard journey of the de-Hamasification of the hearts and minds of the Palestinian people. We must do this not only for Israel, but also as an act of charity for the Arabs. For there is little more dehumanizing than being told that some good and moral standards apply to us, but that you don't need to bother because we have a lower standard for your kind. If we abandon the idea of equal moral standards for all on certain essential elements of human conduct, civilization will descend swiftly into barbarism and many great achievements will be lost. Many more October 7s will follow. Embracing a common minimum standard of civilization is the only way forward. Fortunately for America, her biblical heritage and history together dispose her to do just that. She only looks to them for wisdom and takes the courage to follow it. A decline in courage, Alexander Solzhenitsyn said in 1978, may be the most striking feature that an outside observer notices in the West today. The leaders, he said, get tongue-tied and paralyzed when they deal with aggressors and international terrorists. He then asked rhetorically whether one must point out that from ancient times, a decline in courage has been considered the first symptom of the end. Everything eventually ends, but not all things must end in failure. History, as I said above, does not often give second chances. But since October 7, we now have a second chance to do right by the Jewish people, especially those in Israel. Recently, I have become a Christian and I'm learning what my newfound faith means. I've benefited from the Christian teaching about grace, our great second chance, and that is a free gift from God. Understanding that we're all sinners has seasoned my sense of what is politically possible with humility. But it also gives me hope that no one and no nation is irredeemably lost. In my search for truth, I have learned from the Hebrew script, scriptures written by those Pope John Paul II called my older siblings in the faith. This also has caused me to think about the historic connection between faith and politics in America, especially in relation to domestic and foreign policy. America, in G.K. Chesterton's words, is a nation with the soul of a church. Our biblical heritage once gave America the courage to stand with Europe against Nazism and fascism. Yet America's participation in World War II was slow to solidify. Winston Churchill cajoled Franklin Roosevelt for two years before the tumultuous events of December 1941 made full American involvement politically possible. Roosevelt's political envoy then announced America's intention to stand for civilization against barbarism. After a dinner hosted by Churchill, the US envoy quoted from the book of Ruth, whither thou goest, I will go, and whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. He added, even to the end at which point Churchill wept. I doubt Roosevelt knew precisely how he would meet this obligation when he made it. 
but he had finally mustered the courage to promise it in good faith. Help us now define civilization right for everyone by taking the courage to say to Israel, where you go, I will go, with the courage of a still vital creedal nation for the sake of the nation that came into existence to protect the Jews from a second Holocaust and in the hope of lasting peace and brotherhood with the Arab nations. Courage is not all that will be needed, but without it, no peace convention will ever allow Jews and Arabs to order their own liberty in the Holy Land. Modern civilization and the Judeo-Christian precepts it embraces insist that all men are equal, free, and dependent on one another for sustaining our common aspirations and disciplining our common failings. Civilization is another word for the greatest level of cooperation between the near strangers that the world has ever witnessed, made possible only by measuring all humans in any society with a single standard, which itself is also based on our shared human nature. Thank you. Say um, a very deep and moving address. Thank you very much. Kristen Wagoner uh, is uh, with me on stage. Uh, she is the uh, president and general counsel of Alliance Defending Freedom that John Malcolm uh, <coughs> just mentioned. She is <clears throat> one of America's leading litigators in defense of religious freedom, uh, has many uh, uh, victories in the Supreme Court, and she's now the leader of this magnificent organization. <clears throat> Ion, as we... <laughs> Ion, uh, as was mentioned, uh, you were once a prominent member of the Dutch Parliament. Uh, your most recent book, Prey, is about the erosion of women's rights in Europe as a result of mass immigration and the growth of uh, political Islam and its culture in Europe. Since then, populist and national and conservative parties have been moving into the mainstream in European politics. Uh, they are now participants in almost every government, and the efforts of elites to say that they are illegitimate, that they cannot be part of politics, that's pretty much over. Do you see in this development, you've talked about Israel, mm -hmm. you've talked about the United States. I want to go into flyover country, yeah. Europe. Uh, <laughs> and uh, do you see any hopes there that political changes can lead to some kind of re-recognition of a single civilizational standard, um, a decline in anti-Semitism, um, uh, putting aside uh, the fantastical notions about the potential of Iran under its current leadership to join the community of nations. Is there some, is there some hope uh, there that we might look for? Um, so again, in my newfound faith, I am not allowed to ever give up on hope. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have hope and I'm optimistic and I think that there is a fair chance that Europeans, these movements that you've spoken about, will uh, meet the challenge of persuading the new immigrants to adopt their values and their norms. Um, at the same time, I'm looking here at Nick Eberstadt and pointing to some of the developments we've been looking over decades, which is this decline in populations. On the speed of the decline of birth rates, the demographic decline, is in some ways a lot faster than we can grapple with these, uh, these developments. Um, so there are conditions 
very, very, I mean, it's a very tough battle. And there are mornings when I wake up when I think it's over. Um, but I also see some rays of light. For example, more and more immigrants, whether they're born into Islam or whether like Krishi Sunak, they're born into Hinduism, etc., uh, who are standing up and themselves saying that Europe and the Western legacy is much our, is, is as much ours as those of the, the native peoples. And I think somewhere there lies maybe that silent majority that we are looking up to. Maybe it's not going to come from the, you know, what's left of uh, uh, white European men and women. Maybe it's going to come from these immigrants who, like me, are enchanted by what we found in Europe and in America. Thank you. Christine. Well, you talked about the failure of Western leaders and the lack of courage in this moment that we see, um, and particularly as it applies to October 7th and the pro-Hamas rallies, and these are on our college campuses as well. Um, and I'm, I'm just wondering, as you spoke on the moral confusion that is in our culture, what do you think the cause is of that? I mean, yes, we've, we've abandoned the biblical heritage that we've had the framework for Western civilization, but, but why, and how do we return to it? Yeah, so we ha I think some of us in the, in the larger cities have abandoned it completely. But I think in the middle of the country in the United States, as is in the middle of the country in some of these European uh, countries, um, this heritage is not abandoned, but we have been told uh, not to flaunt it. We are silenced. Um, how do we return to it? I think by becoming vocal again, uh, by realizing that uh, if you look at um, the youth, the millennials and the Gen Zs, but also the immigrants, that the only groups of organized uh, agents who are trying to win their hearts and minds are all the wrong isms, the woke and the Islamists and the Marxists and the socialists, and that the rest of us are just standing there and waiting and hoping that they are too sensible to do something about it. We, I think we might start talking about institutions, but the capture of the educational institutions, the universities, um, even Hollywood. Uh, if you look at the fact that we have all just been around and watched that happen, uh, I think that maybe it's time now that we say no and draw a red line and respond in kind. When, when I think about that as a mother, I think that that happens at my kitchen table and my dinner table and my conversations with my kids, the training that I provide them. But so much of today, I think the average American at least is feeling, what can I contribute to this, yeah. this conversation with this, these institutions being taken over? Well, how would you respond to that in terms of just the average person and what they can do? I know you've said lawyers have a lot to do with this battle as well. So yeah. what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. I think if you separate the masses from the elites, what you're seeing and what you describe the scenes of the kitchen table is that these problems don't leave you alone. You can try and pass your values onto your own children at the kitchen table, and you choose the school that you think fits in with your values. But you're now seeing that it doesn't work that way anymore. The world doesn't leave you alone. These activists don't leave you alone. They come in and they take over your school. They try to take your children away from you, um, intellectually speaking. And so this sense that if they leave us alone, we will leave them alone, that, um, that arrangement doesn't work anymore. Uh, again, I think you might mention that as a former secular uh, let me give you an anecdote of while well, I was here in America that made me uh, wake up to the intolerance of some of these secular movements. It was the cake baking story. There was a huge movement to get uh, rights for the gay population so that they could get married. That happened. That was a success. Now, why did you have to look in the most obscure place for the most obscure baker and force him to do something against his conscience. That wasn't seeking equality. That was 
a kind of triumphalism that made me think these people are actually more intolerant or just as intolerant as the Islamists that I was condemning. But they were secular. And I think part of us just think that, I don't know, let me speak for myself. I think for the longest time, I thought secular people, generally speaking, were tolerant and pluralistic. Well, I, I think I would respond on, on the Jack, that's a Jack Phillips case, and I had the privilege of arguing that case before the Supreme Court, and Jack is still on his third case. We're waiting for an oral argument at the Colorado Supreme Court, yeah. which no. I think goes more towards the isms, because <coughs> now Jack has been targeted by a transgender activist yeah. for Poor declining Jack. to create a cake um, that would celebrate the transition of a, a man to a woman, and he was also asked to celebrate Satanism yeah. with a cake as well. Um, it, and, and this I will not let up mentality of those who are committed to these ideologies. Um, I, I guess I would just ask you, Jack has, has suffered um, as a result, lost a significant portion of his business, but also stood, but, but you have also suffered mm -hmm. significantly for the stands you've taken. And, would you talk a little bit about maybe how you have worked through those issues in your own mind and the call to courage of the average American who may just be like a Jack Phillips in his own bakery just trying to live his life? What happens when that comes to you, that moment to stand? I think you get that uh, fight or freeze uh, uh, reaction where you think this is, this is awful. Um, and I can run away from it, and I can just stick my head in the sand and hope for the best, or I can stand up to these people who want to make an example of me, and I can make an example of them. And I think in, thank you for telling me his name, I didn't know this baker's name. I think what Jack has done is make an example of them, because people like me would not have woken up to the reality that it is these activists who are intolerant, they're the ones who are not letting up. There are millions, billions, and trillions of cakes. They didn't have to get it from Jack. And I walk up to that. And I think the, the, what, the, the point that Jack has gotten across is to Americans and Europeans and all people of decency that the intolerance lies with them. And in fact, the, the right response is to stand up to them. We are taught as a part of our Western culture, though, that pluralism is, is a core tenant um, of who we are and what we extend to others, even, even our opponents who disagree with us. And one of the things I've been struck by in your writings um, is your, your concern about Islamism and how it doesn't extend that same tolerance. And so as we are battling with immigration right now, we're talking about these different issues and seeing these protests. How do we think about pluralism when it feels like we're in a moment in American culture and certainly in, in Europe mm -hmm. where the two almost can't coexist anymore? I think because the assumptions, that assumption just doesn't exist anymore. Those assumptions are gone. Uh, the assumption was we live, you know, live and let live. And th that's just not the case anymore. They won't let you live. They want to impose, just like the Islamists, their views on you and your children and your way of life and the way you do business and the way you pray or you don't pray and, and, and so on. And so I think there is, for us, no choice but to actively recapture the institutions that they have captured or they have taken. And there is some, there's some good news there. I think it's happening. I think more and more Americans are waking up to this. And, um, and arguing against it, uh, exposing it. Um, I think in the beginning we reacted by running away. So in California, for instance, many of my neighbors took their children from these schools. They went and lived in other areas. There was this quiet, I remember in Holland that was called white flight. Some of the neighborhoods would become unbearable, things would change, and people would just move until there is nowhere to go. And so I think America was sort of the house on the hill. There's nowhere else to go. And so at this point, all people who believe in freedom should fight, fight for America and what America represents. And America does not represent wokeism or Islamism or a combination of the two. I, um, 
many years ago, <clears throat> when you and I were first getting to know each other and work, working with each other, I think you would have said that what we need is a return to genuine, tolerant pluralism. Yeah. That 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 is the that the that is the highest goal. I'm not sure that that's your position anymore. It's I don't think, as I listen to you, it's not just that pluralism has revealed itself to be intolerant and actually somewhat authoritarian, but 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 maybe that's it. Are you still of the view that? If we just become tolerant pluralism and hold pluralism as our highest uh, value, that that is sufficient. Is that what you're trying to get us? I'm trying to say that I think there were, uh, when I came to Europe and when I came to the West, there were all sorts of conventions that were established and solidified. That was my assumption. My assumption was when I came to the Netherlands and then later on in other European countries and here in America, that these discussions about pluralism had been resolved. Um, most Americans don't really know what religious wars are, but in Europe, the religious wars were bloody between the Protestants and the Catholics. They were resolved, and, and the result was this pluralism that you're describing, live and let live. And if you want to start a church of 10 people here and a church of 100 people there, you go ahead and do that. And if you want to be of no church and no faith, that's also fine, but we are equal before the law. And that, I think, these assumptions are now broken down. I think on the secular liberal side, we have reneged on that uh, convention, on, on, on that agreement. I think what has emerged is um, a group of secular people who are pulling the carpet from under our feet and who are saying it's my way or the highway. And then along through immigration and globalization come other intolerant organizations and movements like the Islamists. And they think, well, if that's, if you're doing it, so can I, why is my intolerance unacceptable when your intolerance is acceptable? And, and the rest of us, I suppose, we are trying to figure out, we're trying to navigate between these these isms, and so the, the right attitude to respond to this can't just be, we're just going to sit and wait. I think we have to remind people of the roots, the Judeo-Christian roots um, that led to that understanding. I think it's a time to go back into history. I think you should stop being embarrassed uh, about being uh, Jewish or Christian or, or faithful. Um, I know you're not. But uh, when, I, when I'm in Europe, most people will not tell you um, that they are, what their faith is. Only the Islamists will. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to turn to the audience in, in a moment and see if people have questions. But I want to see if Kristen has a final. Sure, sure. I, I would love to just explore your newfound faith a little bit more. I, as I've been reading since um, you wrote the piece on it, it, it seems that you're you're in a no-win in some ways, in that um, your friends, Steven Pinker and Dawkins, are criticizing that you're not fully embracing the truths of Christianity and using it as an organizational tool for society. Um, also, the question has come up about why not just embrace secular humanism. Yeah. Um, and I would just love to hear a little more about a personal journey, because um, to embrace Christianity is to embrace Christ as a Messiah and the risen Savior. And it is an organizational tool, but it's more than that. And I, I think you have experienced that. Will you just talk a little bit about that journey? So on the personal level, not only have I embraced it, but I'm also embarking on a study, a close study of the Old Testament and the New Testament and that a rich history of the human condition and of spirituality. And that is a very personal, very intimate journey. But at the same time, I think on a societal level and on a civilizational level, I think it's the key tool to defining us against them, what makes America different from China, and what makes America and Europe different from those who are imposing radical Islam on us. And can you answer that question without mentioning the Bible? Can you answer that question by saying, we'll only talk about radical humanism? 
So if I'm really sincere and truthful, and I hope that Steven Pinker does the same, and my friend uh, Richard Dawkins, you can't. And I think it's time that we have that conversation and talk about what we have in common. And in fact, all this wonderful reason and uh, enlightenment that we've been enjoying for a long time, where that comes from, where it is rooted, and if you cut that off, as Osginus says, you're going to have a cut flower civilization. And we're very much on the way to that. And so I think we have to stop it not by fighting amongst one another, Steve Pinker versus me and Richard Dawkins versus me. These are trivial, silly fights. But it is by standing up to the real enemy at the gates. Thank you, Ayan. Do we have any questions from the audience? <coughs> If you, if you can please wait for the microphone, introduce yourself, please. Hugo. Hi, I'm uh, Hugo Good, um, editor of the Washington Examiner. Hi, Anne. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you about, uh, in your essay about becoming a Christian, you stated almost axiomatically that the woke would like to destroy this country and everything it stands for. And a question that's always interested me, and I'd love to get your take on this, is, what, and, and it somewhat echoes a question you've already been asked. What is the cause of this desire? Is it, is the starting point a detestation, a sort of self-hating detestation of America, and therefore we adopt policies and uh, ideologies, et cetera, which undermine it? Or do we start as sort of post-Marxists and have these various beliefs and therefore try, want to destroy America because it is the, um, it is the principal bulwark against those ideas? So is it, do you, do you see the distinction? And perhaps it's a distinction without a difference, but um, in result, but it interests me to know that starting point. Anti-Americanism, or is it an embrace of ideas that lead to anti-Americanism? I think it is anti-Americanism, but then that leads to the question, so what is America then? And America's foundational principles, as we've just talked about, are, um, very much religious, very much Judeo-Christian. And I think that there is, um, uh, I'm, I'm just trying to, to grapple with it myself. I mean, how far back do you go? Enemies of civilization have always existed. Um, romantics have always existed. Um, but after the Soviet Union, after the fall of the Soviet Union, we in America may have fallen to, into that trap of the winner, where we think, OK, we've won, let's move on. But obviously, the enemy hasn't moved on. <laughs> they want to win again. Uh, and back in the day when I was at the American Enterprise Institute and I was reading the writings of Osama bin Laden, he was making references to the 17th century. He was making reference to the siege of Vienna. And I think many of us in America have become short-termed, short-sighted, and we think we've won, let's move on. You know, Silicon Valley came along. We lead economically, we lead militarily, we lead culturally. We don't have to worry about all of these other enemies, whether they're coming from the inside or whether they're coming from the outside, because we are so great and our values are self-evident. They'll just take it on. That was the attitude I saw in Europe. And I think we've been so wrong. And I think that is hubris, and we're being brought, we're being humbled. Um, and we haven't prepared our children, the millennials and the Gen Zs, we haven't pre prepared them to fight these types of wars. Good afternoon, my name is Anna Velish, uh, Edmund Burke Foundation. Hello again, so nice to see you. Um, so my question is, you, you said that we should repay in kind. Um, so we have to have a starting point for this conversation. And I just want to pose a question. Would it be a good start to drop the modifier from the word truth? So we're not defending ours, but the thing itself. Um, yes. There isn't my truth and her truth and his truth. There is only the truth. And we have had 
standards for um, showing what is true and what's false and criteria in, in courts. We have well-established routines in academia and in the courts and everywhere to show what is objectively true and what is not. And so this whole this adoption of their language, the language of the work, where they qualify and they say my truth, which means really my feelings. Uh, that's what it is. It is my perception, uh, what we used to call my perception or my sentiment. That is now what is called my truth. But that's, of course, rubbish. And what I find with the woke, for instance, is they don't even want to debate. You know, the Islamists would debate you. They would say, um, the Prophet Muhammad's teachings are superior to the teachings of Christ because look, uh, with the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, look at the sorts of greatnesses and glories we've achieved. But the world won't even debate you. It's, uh, if, if you disagree, you disagree with them, you hurt their feelings, and therefore you hurt their truth, and they pay, they repay you in violence, which they justify somehow. I mean, the world, don't get me started on them. <laughs> 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 I'm looking around to see if there are any more questions. Well, while we're waiting, I'll ask one. Pardon? Yeah. While we're waiting, I'll ask one. <laughs> I am curious, as you're talking about these isms, you know, one of the things that has shocked me a bit is our willingness to, for feminists to forsake women's rights in this moment, um, whether that be from October, the events of October 7th and or the transgenderism movement and what it's doing to women's equal opportunities and safety, um, to the immigration issues and some of the safety issues that we're seeing come up there. Um, and so much of your life has been dedicated to protecting women. And, and I just wonder what your thoughts are on this moment and why they are so willing to abandon the, the you would say, the pendulum has swung in our direction towards women's rights. And they're willing to, to let that fall backwards again. So it's in, in this field of women's rights, that's, I think, where you see this double standard that's been operative for a very long time, where um, my friend, Christina Hoff Summers, um, she had written um, extensively, she and others, on the age-old emancipation of women where we were seeking fairness. And once we achieved that, you know, for... Uh, in, in my view, we, we achieved it in Western civilization. As a woman, I'm free to go to school. I'm free, I have freedoms for me palpably that I didn't have before I came to the West. And these freedoms and rights are guaranteed uh, in law. And I'm protected, at least up to a point I was protected uh, in Western society. But then here came a completely different standard of um, what is described as women's rights, which then um, has as its logical conclusion the elimination of women and what woman is. And this is why I think the transgender activists have gotten to the place that they are at and where we can't make a distinction between what happened on the 7th of October and we accept uh, the assertion that um, rape is resistance. Uh, if you go to the UK now, I've seen posters with the Palestinian flag saying, rape is resistance, and these feminists seem to think that's acceptable, but flirting in the office and uh, all sorts of what Charles Carthammer called normal courtship between men and women, that's criminalized. So you see this double standard in that field of feminism, and I think it is outrageous. I, it's, I, I can't say anything more than that. And I think real women have to stand up uh, against this insanity. We never wanted hostility and enmity in the, in the emancipation of women. That it was never hostility towards men. We were seeking that emancipation with the help of men. It was uh, John Stewart Mill, uh, John Stewart Mill's uh, partner, and he, when they were writing, he was writing the subjection uh, on women, and he was arguing for that emancipation. He was doing side by side with Harriet and not, uh, it wasn't against that, but there's this, uh, I, I suppose it started with the French Revolution uh, and around that time that women's rights, uh, it wasn't about women's rights, it was women as a tool for political ideologies. And uh, women, some women who are stupid enough to fall into that trap 
and allow themselves to be used as tools. Um, uh, <coughs> this has been an intense conversation, and it turns very, very dark, other turns hopeful. Uh, but on this last subject, uh, I, I remember uh, Ion, when you and I first met, you told me an incident where you, as a young girl, had seized women's freedom in a very hostile environment uh, when you were growing up. And uh, the reading of secular novels for pleasure was strictly forbidden. But you told me that you found a friend who supplied you uh, with a bunch of Nancy Drew novels. <laughs> and that it was reading Nancy Drew that you, this is what I want yes. in the world. Yes. Yes. <laughs> So I knew that this was a woman who was going to make a big difference in the world. Yeah. Um, uh, we're really thrilled to have you today. Thank you uh, for this, uh, this very important address that you prepared uh, for us. Kristen, thank you very much for being with us. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. Um, we now have a reception uh, with uh, Ion in the vestibule. Uh, this session is now adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>